All right, I'm sure you're all going to be thrilled to learn that there will be a proof on the final exam. I know proofs is one of the things that caused some anxiety this semester, so I want to spend some time reviewing that, but also give you proper incentive to make sure that you study it. Okay. So, there have basically been three main things that we focused on in our proofs. So on the final, you can expect to see one of these or possibly some combination of them. Okay. The first thing is linearity. That applies when we have a homogeneous equation or a system of equations. Remember, homogeneous just means that there's no function of t all by itself. Any functions of t are the coefficients in front of y and its derivatives, and of course, y and its derivatives are functions of t. Okay. Then we've got the extended linearity principle. That would apply to non-homogeneous equations and systems. Okay. So that would be when there is some function of t that's just hanging out by itself. It's not being multiplied by y or any of its derivatives. Okay. And with both of these, we've seen them in three different contexts. So we've seen them with just a single first order equation. We've seen them with first order systems, which we often write with vector notation. Okay. And then we've seen them with second-order equations. I consider proofs of linearity and extended linearity to be one big topic. Okay. So I know there was a proof on exam two, but there wasn't a proof on exam three. So I tested you on the linearity principle, I think. Oh, gee, was it first-order systems? I think it was with systems. Okay. I didn't test you on it with second-order equations. Any combination of these things is fair game for the exam because I'm looking at the concept and it really is the same. It's the same basic principle, just in three different contexts. Okay. So what I'm going to do is linearity actually has two parts, but they're fairly easy to combine. And then extended linearity has two parts, but they really have to be done separately. Okay. So that gives us three things. In three different contexts, I'm going to prove one thing in, so I'm going to do linearity for first order equations, and then the two parts of extended linearity we'll look at for first order systems and for second order equations. Okay? So we'll get a little bit of each different context and a little bit of each different theorem. Okay? All right, so that's the majority of time that we've spent with proof writing. The other thing is just building so solutions out of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That showed up in the specific case that we were working with linear systems. So once we've gone through these, we'll real quickly review that. If you remember on exam two, I actually did a little bit of a mix and match. I created a problem that combined building solutions out of eigenvalues and eigenvectors with some of the linearity principle that we had. So proofs, you know, don't just say, oh, she might put this proof on there and try to memorize it. Try to go for the big picture so that you can say, oh, I know what I'm doing, and I'm just doing it in this context instead of that context. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's prove the linearity principle for a first order equation. Okay, so I'm going to have a differential equation that I'm going to call star. Okay. f of t times dy by dt plus g of t times y of t equals zero. So that's a first order homogeneous equation. Now a lot of the examples that we solved were constant coefficient, but it doesn't have to be constant coefficient to be linear. It's linear if I've got some of these plus some of these, and it's homogeneous if that's equal to just zero. If I had a function of t over here that was not zero, like if this were equal to t squared, it would still be linear, but then it would be non-homogeneous. Okay. All right, so the linearity principle says if y1 of t and y2 of t are solutions to star, then ay1 plus by2 is also a solution for a and b, any real numbers. Okay. 
Now, linearity can be broken up into two parts. If I've got a homogeneous e linear equation and I have a solution, any multiple of that is also a solution. So one part of linearity is that if y1 is a solution, so is a times y1 for any real number a. Similarly, if y2 is a solution, so is b times y2 for any real number b. Okay. Then the second part of linearity is that if I have two solutions, I can add them together, and that's also going to be a solution to that homogeneous equation. Okay. So here, I'm dealing with constant multiples and addition together in one. I could ask you to do one or both. Here, we're going to do both. Okay, generally my rules when you're doing a proof is that you can take the differential equation as given. That's all you can take as given. Okay. So everything else you've got to introduce. And if I am proving an if-then, I always start by supposing the if. So, suppose, and I'm picky about that. I want suppose. I don't want if. That's kind of wishy-washy. That's like, maybe we should let it be a solution. No, we're going to suppose. We're doing a thought experiment here. We are making it true, at least in our minds, that these are solutions, and then we're exploring, what does that mean? It's very exciting. Okay, so suppose y1 of t and y2 of t are solutions to star. And almost always after I state my supposition, immediately what I do is I say what that means. What does it mean for these guys to be solutions? Well, if y1 is a solution, what I know is that when I plug that in, I get a true equation. So f of t times the derivative of y1 with respect to t plus g of t times y1 of t is going to equal 0. Let's call that smiley face. We might need to refer back to that. Okay. And also, because I assumed, I supposed rather, uh, that y2 is also a solution, so f of t times the derivative of y2 with respect to t plus g of t times y2 of t is equal to zero. And I shall refer to that as monster. Okay, so I've stated my supposition and I've spelled out what it means, which gives me something to work with later on. I always suppose the if. My job is to prove the then. I find it helpful to just claim that the then is true, to write it out so that I can see exactly what I'm trying to prove. Okay. Now, if I'm going to state the then, I'm going to be introducing two new things. A and B are going to be real numbers, but this wasn't information that was given. That wasn't in star. So I'm going to just introduce those right off the bat. Let's let A and B be real numbers. My claim then is that a y1 of t plus b y2 of t is a solution to star. And just like my supposition was about being a solution, my claim is about being a solution. I'm going to find it helpful to spell out what it means to be a solution. So, coming from here, continuing, I'll say that is, in other words, this is still my claim, okay, that f of t times the derivative with respect to t of a y1 of t plus b y2 of t plus g of t times a y1 of t plus b y2 of t is equal to zero. Now, I do want to be careful. This is my claim. This is the thing I'm about to prove. So I'm just going to make a note that this is still my claim, but written out as an equation. Okay. So now to prove it, I'm going to start with this left-hand side, and I'm just going to simplify it. And I'm going to hope that I'm able to simplify it to arrive at 0. Okay. Now, I'm going to need some space, so I'm just going to off to the side here, write that smiley face was that y1 is a solution, 
and monster was that Y2 is a solution. Ordinarily, I'd have this on the paper to refer back to, or on a much larger board to refer back to, but in the interest of space, we'll just let that go. Okay, so the left-hand side is f of t times the derivative of a y1 of t plus b y2 of t plus g of t times a y1 of t plus b y2 of t. Okay. All I did right there was copy it. Okay. Now, I'm going to use a rule of derivatives. I'm going to use the sum rule of derivatives. So I can just take the derivative of each piece and add those together. So I can say this is the derivative of ay1 of t plus the derivative of by2 of t. Okay. Plus, now here, I'm going to just distribute the g of t. So g of t times ay1 of t plus g of t times by2 of t. Okay. Now, I'm okay with you not explicitly writing reasons for your steps if you just do one thing at a time. Now, I did do two things in this, but I really did one thing at a time. Over here, I did one thing. I used the sum rule of derivatives. Then on this part, I did one thing. I used the distributive property of real number multiplication. I'm totally fine with you explicitly writing that out. I'm okay with you not explicitly writing your reason in words as long as you do one step at a time. Okay. So now, what I'm going to do, just in the interest of space, I'm going to say the reasons rather than writing them because my board space is so limited. Okay. So now I'm going to say this is f of t. I'm going to use another property of derivatives, which is the constant multiple rule. So I can pull those constants out, and I can say this is a times the derivative of y1 of t plus b times the derivative of y2 of t. And I do ask in your proofs that you do one step at a time, that you make it. I mean, you might be able to go straight to here, and that might be clear to some people, but when you start combining steps, it, your proof becomes harder to read. The idea is by taking small steps, even somebody who's struggling a little bit in this class can sort of follow the steps. Why is that true? Oh, she just pulled the constant out. Okay, good. Okay. So, I'm going to just leave this as is for now. <laughs> because I've got more work to do over here with this first term. Now, I'm going to do over here what I did previously here. I'm going to just distribute that coefficient function of f. In fact, I might have chosen to wait to distribute the g until I was ready to distribute the f and then do both at the same time. That would have been perfectly acceptable. So this is going to be f of t times a times the derivative of y1 of t plus f of t times b times y2 of t. I'm sorry, times the derivative. Ah. Times b times the derivative of y2 of t plus g of t times a y1 of t plus g of t times b y2 of t. And there we go. Okay, what I want to do now is just rearrange things a little bit. I really want to have the f's and the g's right next to the y's and their derivatives. But this is really just multiplication of three things. That's f times a times the derivative of y1. That's f times b times the derivative of y2. It's a product of three real valued things. a and b are just numbers f of t, y1, and y1 prime are just derivatives of real valued functions. And so I can rearrange the order of the multiplication. That's totally fine. I'm basically using, and this is the one time you can do two things at once, I'm using the commutative property to change the order and the associative property. Right now the a is grouped with the y Want with the derivative of y1, and I'm going to move it in front, so I've got to break it apart from that grouping. Okay. So, formally, I'm using the commutative and associative properties of real number arithmetic. Informally, I'm just rearranging the factors. 
<laughs> so this is going to be a times f of t times the derivative of y1 of t plus b times f of t times the derivative of, I'm sorry, not times, yes, times the derivative of y2 of t <laughs> plus, I'm going to do the same thing here, a times g of t times y1 of t plus b times g of t times y2 of t. All right, and so now I want to try to get to where I can use star and monster. So I want the pieces that have the y1s in them to be together, and I want the pieces that have the y2s in them to be together. Well, I'm thinking I can get that by just swapping the order of those two terms. <laughs> so, a times f of t times the derivative of y1 of t plus a times g of t times y1 of t plus b times f of t times the derivative of y2 of t plus b times g of t times y2 of t. <laughs> so now all my y1 pieces are together and I might notice that they have something nifty in common here. What they have in common is that there's an A in front of them. So I can factor that out. So this is A times F of T times the derivative of Y1 of T plus G of T times Y1 of T. And here these two terms that involved Y2 have a B in front of them. So that's B times F of T times the derivative of y2 of t plus g of t times y2 of t. Notice this is exactly the left-hand side of star, which used to be here, but I erased it. This is exactly the left-hand side of star with y1 plugged in. So by smiley face, I know that this is equal to 0. And this is exactly the left-hand side of star with y2 plugged in. By monster, I know that that's zero. So, by having spelled out what my supposition means earlier on, I know that that's a times zero plus b times zero, which is just going to give me zero. <laughs> and that proves what we were trying to prove. What we did is we plugged in a y1 plus b y2 to our differential equation and we showed that it gives us a true equation. We plugged it into the left hand side and we simplified it to zero. So this is a solution to star. <laughs>